All right, what's going on, guys? Hope everybody had a good day, week, and uh, I hope you have a good upcoming week. I wanted to talk about uh, this article here that I have up on the screen, Superfluid Collateral. Uh, this was a pretty interesting article that specifically has to do with a lot of these assets that are being locked up in some of the decentralized finance applications that are uh, available right now from like Maker and Compound. And uh, when you lock up something like Ethereum in uh, a Maker CDP, uh, what if you could actually use the extra, uh, I should say, use the locked up ETH that's just sitting there in that smart contract in uh, something like Compound to, to get interest? Um, obviously, if that money is just sitting there locked, it's not being used and it can be used. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump into the article and um, make some comments as we go through it. While the past year was a tough one for the public crypto markets, talented and dedicated teams spent it heads down, shipping what appear to be some of the building blocks of a truly open financial system. As a result, while 2017 was the year of the ICO and 2018 was the year of continued massive private token sales, 2019 is shaping up to be the year of open finance, which obviously includes DeFi. Most significantly, Maker, which launched at the tail end of 2017, has created a system for minting a USD-denominated stablecoin, DAI, using collateralized debt positions. The system has performed incredibly well, with DAI smoothly retaining the dollar peg and CDP sucking up uh, uh, less than 2% of all ETH, I'm sorry, about 2% of all ETH during a year in which ETH declined as much as 94% from its all-time high. Maker isn't the only one, I'm sorry, Maker isn't the only way to borrow or lend crypto assets. Dharma allows users to request or offer loans for any ERC-20 uh, fungible or ERC-21 non-fungible asset. DYDX enables derivatives and long short margin trades and Compound offers money market borrowing lending for ETH, DAI, and a handful of other tokens. Um, I actually have a video that goes over um, many of these tools. It's popping up right now. Um, it's about, uh, it's decentralized finance, um, explain part one. Decentralized exchange protocols, i.e. DEXs like uh, 0x and Kyber are now functional as third-party exchanges and interfaces to access them. Uh, examples being Radar Relay, um, eSwap or EA Swap, allowing non-custodial trading to become a viable reality. The liquidity is still somewhat lacking across the board. In November, a new completely on-chain DEX launched that makes it possible to provide liquidity and earn fees automatically using basically the same approach as Bancor, but simplified to remove unnecessary to remove the unnecessary token. Hello, Uniswap. And I also have a video on Uniswap, which is popping up right now, uh, if you want more details about that. And of course, Augur shipped version one of their long-awaited prediction market protocol for which both Vale and Guesser have recently launched centralized services that enable vastly improved user experiences. We now have almost, we now have almost a fully decentralized uh, option for borrowing, lending, and trading crypto assets, creating derivatives around any asset or event, and even a USD-denominated stablecoin that allows risk-off positions and greatly improved user experience without ever needing to directly touch that dirty, dirty fiat. And now we're going to get into collateral and um, how there are some options around collateral. One of the core tenets of open finance is that of, is that of permissionlessness. But if there are any, if, if there are no gatekeepers, then how can we be sure that a borrower won't default on a loan or that a derivative will pay out as intended? The answer is collateral. In a nutshell, collateral is posted as a form of insurance for the other participants in the system so that you can be trusted to take certain actions without anything else being known about who you are, where you live, how competent you are, and so forth. If your actions ever come close to harming the system, you are automatically booted out and some or all of your collateral is handed over to more responsible parties. In the maker system, in order to borrow dollars and die, you must lock more than 150% of the equivalent value in ETH in a CDP. If your collateral ratio ever drops below 150%, a watcher will step in and poof, your collateral is liquidated at a 13% penalty to repay your loan. So they don't take the entire 150%. They'll take the original 100% 
plus the 13% penalty. Compound and Dharma employ similar structures to ensure lenders don't need to be worried that borrowers won't repay their loans. Naturally, builders and participants in, open, in the open finance ecosystem have tended to think of assets used as collateral as just that, assets in use as collateral. Those assets may eventually be released and used for other purposes once a loan is repaid. But for now, um, their uh, French word is to be collateral. But what if it doesn't have to be that way? And this is where we get into actually utilizing this collateral in other ways when it's locked into that smart contract. There are currently over 2 million ETH locked in maker CDPs. And this is from February of this year. So this is, uh, it probably is more at this point. Generating around 78 million DAI. That means at current prices, more than half the ETH in CDPs isn't even technically required for collateral. It is completely dead. It is a completely dead, unproductive asset. So just trying to make this clear. Um, so everybody has to lock at least 150% of, um, of ETH into a CDP in order to get a loan of 100%. So, uh, and some people lock more than 150%. 150% is just the uh, minimum that you have to lock in in order to get a, um, to open a CDP with Maker. So, uh, in addition to the um, 100% that is being held for the loan, there's also the other 50% on top of that that's really just sitting there. Honestly, the whole, all of the ETH is just sitting there. Um, but I think this first part here, they're just talking about the, um, the extra um, 50%, the over collateralization that is actually um, just sitting there and not doing anything when it's not really required um, as long as ETH doesn't go down. It's not required to meet the requirements for the loan. Uh, so May Jane, founder of Instadap, recently proposed automating the process of sweeping excess ETH out of CDPs and into Compound's money market protocol to earn interest. The process of moving ETH back to a CDP as needed would also be automated, of course. That is a great first step and one that is relatively straightforward to implement by integrating the maker and compound protocols as they exist today. So just taking the maker and compound protocols as they exist on Ethereum today, uh, a tool can be created that would actually um, allow this to happen but they get into some of the caveats here. But what about the rest of the ETH that is sitting in the CDPs, ensuring that they meet the minimum 150% collateral requirement? Why couldn't that also be sitting in a compound money market available for others to borrow and earning the current 0.27% APR? It's kind of low. While a single unit of ETH can't literally be in two places at once, one of the primary breakthroughs of Bitcoin was the solving of the double spending problem. There's no reason why deposits in, into Compound couldn't be made through a deposit token contract, which issues an equivalent number of Compound ETH or CETH, CDI, CREP, etc., uh, ERC20 tokens. These CETH tokens would always be redeemable one-to-one -one for ETH in Compound. Ryan Sean Adams points out the same approach could be used in the future by staking pools with staked ETH. Uh, so uh, just to kind of break this down, if you guys don't understand, um, because of the ETH is locked into a smart contract, moving it into something else can be difficult because obviously the ETH can't exist in one smart contract and then another uh, smart contract for compound. But to get around this, what they can do is, is that they can create a, another ERC-20 token that maps one-to-one -one with the ETH that is actually used for, I mean, it doesn't have to map to the exact ETH, but it's mapped one-to-one -one just like DAI is mapped one-to-one -one with the dollar. Um, so that if people need to get to this collateral, they can by just redeeming a C ETH for um, a real ETH. Given this reliable, transparent backing, once multi-collateral DAI is shipped, it is not hard to imagine that CETH could be added as a supported collateral type for Maker, especially with speculation that much Maker activity today is driven by ETH holders who are looking to go long with leverage. It makes sense that there would be also, makes sense there would also be demand for earning interest on ETH that sits as collateral. 
CETH is fairly base is a fairly basic example of liquid collateral, but what if liquid collateral was actually used to provide liquidity? Uniswap is a fully on-chain decentralized exchange. Rather than maintain an order book, Uniswap uses liquidity pools and an automated market maker to determine the price at which an asset can be traded. I like I said earlier in the video, there is a um, a link to this um, to the Uniswap. Um, overview, which is uh, in the description if you didn't catch the pop-up. Um, kind of go past this because it's just going over Uniswap. Um, so what they're saying here is that Uniswap liquidity pool can be used for this. The ETH DAI pair is currently the second deepest liquidity pool on Uniswap. Both assets are also available on Compound. It would be great for anyone providing ETH DAI liquidity on Uniswap to also earn interest on their assets by having them simultaneously available on Compound for borrowing. Again, the C ETH type trick would work here for half the equation, uh, making a C DAI. But it feels like there's potentially there's potential to do more direct integration or rewriting of the two protocols to make this possible. A different trick with Uniswap that definitely works is using the liquidity pair itself as collateral. Uh, i.e. ETH, DAI, as opposed to each of the assets in that pair, ETH and DAI. What does that mean? Well, although most Ethereum wallets don't show them by default, whenever you deposit liquidity into a Uniswap pool, your share of that pool is actually represented by ERC-20 tokens. Uh, and that's what this tweet says here. Poking around on Etherscan, I realized Uniswap pool shares are actually ERC-20 tokens. Uh, what that means is uh, it would be it would theoretically be possible to have the same assets simultaneously provide liquidity and act as maker DAO or Dharma collateral, which is pretty sweet. Any system willing to accept as collateral both assets in an ETH XYZ pair should also be willing to accept the corresponding Uniswap pool shares as collateral. Uniswap's automated market maker function ensures that the combined value of the two pairs um, in that pool share will not will never drop more than either of these two assets. In fact, all else equal, the value of uh, the pair pool shares will rise over time based on earnings from tradings from trading fees being added to the liquidity pool. Uh, I predict we'll see Uniswap pool shares as collateral for millions of dollars in loans in months, not years. So. I know that was, was just a bunch at once here, but what they're saying is, is that by using Uniswap's, um, the way that Uniswap does its, uh, its DEX, its uh, decentralized exchange, and the way that it does its liquidity pools, um, it is possible to actually uh, use, to actually, by using some of the same methods that was mentioned above here with um, creating a ERC-20 token to represent um, the collateral die or compound I, I'm sorry, compound ETH. Now I'm mixing myself up. Um, but with Uniswap, uh, it's a bit easier to utilize the liquidity pool for um, collateral and for moving it into something like compound or Dharma for, um, for gaining interest on those tokens since they would just be sitting there anyway. So now we're getting into what could go wrong. Anyone familiar with the world of prime brokerage services will immediately recognize the process described in the preceding sections as a form of rehypothecation, a lender taking an asset posted as collateral by a borrower and using that same asset as collateral to take out another loan. Except this is <laughs> except in this case, we may see collateralized collateral, collateralizing collateralized collateral, and so on and so forth. Oi. This creates a daisy chain situation. If there's a failure at any link along the chain, all of the assets further down the chain will also fail, but anything further up, i.e. closer to the original underlying collateral should be fine. However, it's extremely unlikely this chain of collateralization would be created in a neatly serialized fashion. All available evidence suggests that financial engineers will slice, lever, mix and sling every imaginable asset in every imaginable combination to create new products they can sell to each other or the unwashed masses. It will probably end up looking more like this. <laughs> yeah. Is this really any worse than the legacy financial system? Probably not. Technically, this would all 
be publicly viewable and auditable rather than hidden behind a series of closed doors and incomprehensible legal contracts. We should be able to devise systems to track and quantify risk when everything is linked together via public ledgers and immutable automated contracts. We should be able to self-regulate, put in place reasonable standards, and refuse to interact with contracts or protocols that don't demand conservative margins and ensure the collateralization chain doesn't go more than a couple layers deep. But given that we know, given what we know of human nature, do you really think we'll show restraint when the possibility exists to earn ex an extra point of yield or pay, or pay a slightly lower rate on a loan? Uh, and then it just gets into this actually sounds like a good idea because of what's possible. Um, my thoughts on this whole thing is um, it's definitely a slippery slope. Um, it's something that could get out of hand. They are correct. Or so the author is correct. The author is uh, Dan. Dan is correct when uh, says that, um, you know, you can just choose not to interact with these smart contracts. Um just like anything else, um, these smart contracts are just decentralized applications um, that really have to do with money. And if you really don't want to get caught up in this kind of thing, you, you can choose not to. Um, I don't think something like this could bring down the entire DeFi system, but it is something that um, I, I think it would be okay to maybe utilize um, something like the over collateralized uh, ETH in a CDP. So if you, like I was talking about the, the extra 50% of the 150% um, of a uh, CDP could then be moved over into compound. Now this, um, from what I understand, this, that um, interest that's being made would be made by um, the lender and not the borrower. Um, so obviously the, the, the lender, yeah, the lender. So the borrower wouldn't be making this interest. Um, but uh, it is something that I thought was a good topic because it just shows that um, when you control everything, um, basically all of the uh, finance instruments through smart contracts, the level of detail that you can get into um, with where the money goes, how it's routed, uh, where it lives, what kind of smart contracts are intera interacting with it. it it's very, um, like he said in the last paragraph here, it's, uh, there's something in, uh, undeniably compelling about all this. And uh, it's because we're able to do things with, with money, uh, with currency that we've never been able to do before um, because we have so much control over how the money is moved around and uh, stored and, uh, how it's interacted with regarding the smart contracts uh, that we've, we've never had that control before. So uh, I'll have a link to this article in the description as I always do. Uh, please like, subscribe, share uh, if you enjoyed this video. And that's all I got for today. Thanks.